And I'll go ahead also to mute and please unmute when you want to ask or say something. All right, so just again, an announcement, and I'll announce it again at the end of our class that we will not be meeting next Thursday. I'll be in New York, God willing, with my grandchildren, taking care of them. And uh, so we will resume the following Thursday. And then just to also give you a heads up, um, I will also be off the month of July until I think the very end of July. Our kids, God willing, are coming from Israel. Our son has permission to fly. And so they are coming July 1st. So we're going to be busy with those grandchildren. So then we will reconvene. I think the last week in July, I'll look at my calendar, but I think we'll be able to reconvene then. And then we should talk about um, meeting in person. So we're trying to work out some sort of a hybrid of being in person, but also having a Zoom option so that people who are not in Denver can join it and continue to join us if they would like, um, because it's been really nice having, you know, a across the country uh, in, engagement with everybody. I've really enjoyed it. So we want to see how we can do that. So we'll need some time for adjusting to a new schedule. So I'll be in touch with you about that, but just to give you a heads up for that. All right. Ellen, you, yes. I have a question. Sure. I Marcia. thought your daughter-in-law was pregnant then. How long, how far along is she that they, that she's flying? Thank God she's due the end of September. So she, she can come in under the wire. Oh, cause it's not so much going out. It's coming back as well. Right. So she'll be, she'll be able to, to come. So God willing, all that goes well too. So a lot of floating factors, the more people, the more factors gets. That's why everything is like, God willing, God willing, God willing. Who knows? We plan and then we see what happens. All right. Why don't we start with our blessing? Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher bachar banu mikol hamim v'natan lanu et torato baruch atah Adonai notein haTorah. This week is Parshat Korach. Parshat Korach which is the second Parsha that involves some, a very challenging and difficult uh, scenario happening to the Jewish people in the desert. Last week we had the spies, that didn't turn out so well. This week we have Korach's rebellion, Korach who stages rebellion against Moshe and Aaron. It's really against God, but it's through Moshe and Aaron. So we're going to talk about two very different aspects of this um, rebellion and Moshe's response in two diametrically opposite ways. Um, and we're going to talk about that. And I also want to just, of course, everyone hopefully knows that today is Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. So this is the new month of Tammuz. The quality for the month of Tammuz, the spiritual quality for the month of Tammuz is the quality of sight. It is how we see and perceive things this is the month to really focus on having an eye in tov, having a good eye, which means having a good eye about other people, uh, about ourselves <clears throat> and our situations, whatever scenario that we're in, whatever circumstances, to be able to see the good and to judge things favorably. We know that the spies made their big mistake by having an evil eye toward the land of Israel and got us, got us all in trouble. And that Korach, we will see, also has a, an, an evil eye towards Moshe. And he has a bad eye toward himself. He was the wealthiest person of the entire Jewish people. It said that some, the some Midrash says like, he had, I'm gonna exaggerate this, but it was like 50 or a hundred white mules just carrying the keys to his safes that had the money in it. So what that exactly means, I don't know, but he was the wealthiest, he was a scholar, he was powerful, he was Moshe's first cousin, he was in the tops of the tops, but he did not perceive any of that, kind of like Haman, who was also at the top, second to the king, wealthy, everybody honored him because he was missing one thing, which was Mordechai bowing down to him, and Korach was missing one thing, he was not the Kohen Gadol, he was not the high priest, everything else did matter to him, and he basically forfeited all of it because he could not perceive how blessed he was. And so with that, 
he and his family, his beautiful family, and his possessions are all swallowed up by the earth. So we say that people who seek honor, uh, who seek wealth, who seek acclaim, their ego, their desires, they end up getting swallowed up. And whether it's figuratively um, or an actual case with Korach of actually getting swallowed up, it swallows us up and takes us out of this world. So that to stay in this world is to be a place with a good eye, to be grateful for what we have, to see circumstances from the perspective of Rabbi Akiva, who even in times of challenge and difficulty, always saw the good side. He always saw the benefit. Even after the temple was destroyed and there are foxes running through the place of the Holy of Holies and the other sages were weeping, that Rabbi Akiva was laughing. He asked them, why are you crying? And they're like, it's so awful. The holiest place has now has foxes running through it. And why are you, Akiva, why are you laughing? He said, because that was a prophecy that that would be destroyed and foxes would run through the hills. And that means that came true. So the other prophecy will also come true, that it will be rebuilt and children and old men and women will be running through the streets of Jerusalem. That will also come true. So I'm laughing now. I don't have to wait until it happens. I know it's going to happen. And when you know something is going to happen, you can celebrate in advance. So we talked last night in our living in the present moment conversation that it talks about women specifically in Asia Chayel, woman of valor that a woman laughs at the time to come. It's like, what does that mean? She laughs at the time to come. It's like, she laughs now about the joy that's going to happen in the future. It's like, well, don't you have to wait till it happens? But you don't have to wait. It would be equivalent to finding out that you won the lottery. You don't say, I'll get excited when I get the check and cash it. Like as soon as you get the call saying you won, you're already jumping up and down. So if we already know it's going to happen, so be happy now. So this is the, the perspective that we are trying to cultivate. Celebrate now. The month of Tammuz is a very challenging month because in a few weeks, we're going to observe the 17th of Tammuz, which is a fast day that is commemorating the beginning of the destruction of the Holy Temple. And yet we hold a place open because in the future, it's going to be a yantif. It's going to be a holiday. So on that day of the 17th of Tammuz, just like on Tisha B'Av, the 9th of Av, which commemorates the complete destruction of both temples and many other calamities, there's a prayer called Tachanun that we don't do, which is only usually not done on Yantifs, like Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot. On Yantifs, we don't say Tachanun. And on the 17th of Tammuz and Tisha B'Av, we also don't say Tachanun. It's like saying, I know it's not looking good now, but there will be a time when this will be a yuntif, and we're doing a little mini yuntif preparation now. We're holding it open now. So there's nothing that says that we can't create the space for the yuntif now. So this is our goal, and we do this through the, the eye of the re'iya, it's called of sight, how we perceive things, how we perceive reality. This is our goal, korach did this very poorly. This, this um, Parsha is always read during the month of Tammuz. In fact, it often coincides with Rosh Chodesh. Tammuz often falls on a Shabbos. And this Parsha is read. So it's like Korach and Rosh Chodesh Tammuz go hand in hand. One is to be an antidote for the other. It's like, how do we correct Korach? How do we correct the spies? How do we get out of this sinkhole we're entering the sinkhole period of the Jewish calendar, starting with Tammuz. We're kind of, uh, everyone kind of gets a little nervous um, starting Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. It's because like we're getting into this period of time. And then we're going to get to the 17th of Tammuz. And we will enter then a three-week period of semi-morning until we hit Rosh Chodesh Av. And then we go deeper until we have the nine days culminating in Tisha B'Av, which is the very bottom. So it's like this whole time, it's like when you're entering into a time, many people have this in their own personal lives. Is something very challenging happened to you at a certain time of year, that as that time of year starts to approach on the anniversary of, you almost can start feeling it in your kishka. It just, it's not happening, but it's kind of feels like it is. So we're like entering into this stage and this is the time to literally take the bull by its horns. Um, yes, 
yes, uh, Rachel Moshori just said I was going to mention there's a big sinkhole that opened up in the parking lot at Shari Tzedek Hospital, which is where my grandchildren were born. So a huge sinkhole. So I was thinking of exactly that. I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a sinkhole. It's like, oh, uh, we don't need sinkholes. So what do you do with a sinkhole? You fill it. Okay, you fill it. So our job is in the sinkhole of time that we are entering into now. Our job is to correct it. So the tikkun, the repair, the repair of that is to have the eye in tov, to have the good eye, seeing our own selves from a place of blessing, seeing other people with the benefit of the doubt, seeing situations for what's the, you know, where's the, where's the light here? Where's the light in this dark situation? And to be able to enjoy it now and not just say, oh, in the future, we'll see it. It's like, if you know what's going to happen, you can celebrate it now. You cannot say Tachanun now, even though we're not there yet. So that's our goal is, is a lot of work to do um, during this month. These are called the summer months as they are the summer. In Hebrew, the word for summer is kaitz, and it's related to the word kates, which means end. It's like the end of the story, Tisha B'Av, that was supposed to be the day that Moshe comes down from Mount Sinai with the tablets and the Jewish people get ready to march into the land of Israel. That's what was supposed to have happened. That was plan A. And then it doesn't happen. And then we have the spies, another different plan. It's like all the plans just keep getting messed up. So what we're supposed to do is we're supposed to say, okay, how can I correct that? What was the mistake? So just like in an organization after an event, you have a meeting and you talk about what went wrong. What went right, what went wrong, and how can we fix it better for next time? So we're asking those same questions of ourselves. And we're not saying, oh, we're correcting from you know, thousands of years ago. It says, if the temple has not been rebuilt now, it means it's as if it has been destroyed again. It's still be being destroyed in, that, in the, an active way. It is continuing to happen. So that's our challenge. So we want to learn two lessons specifically today about Korach. One of these I heard from Rabbi Moshe Bamberger, and the other one I heard from a person whose name I have forgotten, but is not my idea. So you are, have a Chumash, and you are in a stone Chumash on page 821, chapter 16, verse 1 begins the rebellion of Korach. And it says, Korach, the son of Yitzchar, son of Kahat, son of Labi, separated himself with Datan and Aviram, sons of Eliav, and own son of Pele, the offspring of Reuven. Just to point out, Reuven is the oldest child of Leah, and his name has to do with sight. Reia, Reuven, see my son. Leah was hoping that when she gave birth to a son, that Yaakov would love her as much as he loved Rachel. Didn't exactly work out and Reuven has a lot of issues. Um, it's not surprising that he joins in initially um, with On, um, is from the tribe of Reuven because Reuven lost the rights of the firstborn because of what Reuven himself did with his messing with his father's intimacy. So if anybody's gonna have some jealousy over power and honor, it's going to be from the tribe of Reuven. It says also that the, the Reubenites lived, they were neighbors with Korach's Levi family. He was from the, from the family of Kahat. The family of Kahat lived near the Reubenites. So it's from this we have woe to the evil person and woe to his neighbor. It says we are influenced by the people we hang out with. And so... Korach was able to get On revved up in a rebellion against Moshe. In the end, On does not participate, but that is only thanks to his wife, who makes sure that she does that he does not participate. But otherwise, he was on the road to do that, and that was the, from the tribe of Reuven. So they gathered together. It says they stood before Moshe with 250 men. These 250 men were sages. They were not riffraff, rabble raisers. These were men, these were great, great people. And it says there, from the children of Israel, leaders of the assembly, those summoned for meeting, men of renown. They gathered together against Moshe and against Aaron and said to them, it's too much for you. You have too much power. 
for the entire assembly, all of them are holy and Hashem is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves over the congregation of Hashem? Okay, we're going to get back to that. The next sentence, the next two sentences are what we're going to zero in on first. It says, Moshe heard and fell on his face. Moshe heard and fell on his face. And his response was, he spoke to Korach and to his entire assembly saying, in the morning, God will make known the one who is his own and the Holy One, and he will draw him close to himself. And whomever he will choose, he will draw close to himself. Okay, so we're going to ask the question where it says Moshe heard and fell on his face. It says, Moshe heard what? Now, I always have thought, well, what he heard is what we just said, that the people said, it's too much for you, for the entire assembly, all of them are holy, and Hashem is among them. Why do you exalt yourselves over the congregation of Hashem? That's not what actually he heard. So in the Talmud, there is a whole discussion of the story, the backstory to this of what it was that Moshe heard. It says, what did he hear? And he fell on his face. What he heard is that before they talked to him about power, they accused him of wrongdoing. They accused him of having adulterous relationships with their wives. What? What? Completely, complete fabrication. We know that Moshe had separated from his own wife because after a man has a seminal emission, he needs to immerse in the mikvah. And because he needed to be available 24 seven and he alone, nobody else, he alone needed to be available 24 seven. He had separated from intimacy from his wife, which is what had led when we talked about in previous Parsha, Miriam talking to Aaron about Moshe because there had been some other people prophesying in the camp, Medad and Eldad. And Moshe's wife, Zipporah, was overheard saying, woe to them and woe to their wives. And Miriam hears this. It's like, what is she talking about? And she shared, you know, Moshe, we don't have an, inti we don't have an intimate life. And Moshe is separated from me. And so she was saying these other prophets, their wives are going to, they're going to separate from their wives. And Miriam and Aaron, that's what they got so upset about. Miriam's like, I'm a prophetess. Aaron's a prophet. We have relations with our spouses. Moshe's doing something wrong. That was their conversation that ends up being the Lashon Hara. So this, this, is, this is what was being talked about. So Moshe was so careful even with his own wife. So never mind that he would never have secluded himself with other women. And all these men are saying, you've been having adulterous relationships with our wives. What is the answer to that? There is no answer to that. It is complete fabrication. It says he falls on his face. What could have or should have he had said? What do people say? And I'm not talking about, you know, kind of the trend now of, of you know, I forget what that was called, of people stepping forward about people abusing them and having, we're not talking about that. We're talking about a completely fabricated charge. Moshe does not respond to them. He doesn't yell back at them. He doesn't have them carted off or executed or he doesn't do anything. He says nothing. He is so humble that he says nothing. He says, what are we supposed to learn from this? And I just want to say this, this is not about ongoing abusive relationships. It's not about that. Those are wrong and those have to be spoken out and those have to come and see the light of day. That is absolutely essential. This is complete fabrication. This is what comes from when people are in positions of leadership. People say mean things and they say things that aren't true. They just do. And this is, we're not necessarily talking about, you know, we're not necessarily talking about national leadership. We're talking about, you know, the president of the shul, people on the board, the people who are ahead of things, the mayor, I mean, all these things. Now, again, we are not talking about things that are true. We're talking about things that are not true. But how do we respond when somebody says something mean about you? What do you do? And there's actually the idea that you say nothing. You say nothing. And you take it. And you take it and you are given an incredible power. You are given an incredible power because it's so 
superhuman that most people can't do it. So we have an idea that people who are insulted, so we'll call it that, people who are insulted. So we're assuming it's not true, not people who have shortcomings that are true that are being pointed out to them. When people are being insulted, especially in public, but insulted, and if they don't respond, they are given what's called the koach of bracha. They're given the power to bless. Power to bless. I don't know if any of you have ever had this happen to you when you've been insulted and insulted publicly. So that if you keep your mouth shut and then utter a prayer and you have the power of blessing, you can also bless somebody else. So unfortunately, fortunately, whatever, I've had this happen to me a couple of times, you know, where people say things that are not true and they are act in a way that is humiliating and very upsetting and I don't respond. Um, so I'll just, I'll just give you an example, very sadly. A number of years ago, you might remember that I was on a board and a member of the board decided to sue all the members, of, all the other members of the board with complete like fabricated things. And it went to court because actually I, I used to think that courts work that you had to like prove that you had kind of had a point, but you actually don't have to, there's, very little you have to do to take someone to court. So it went to trial, the whole thing. We ended up settling. It was a bizarre settlement. It was really crazy. And there was this, it was a whole thing. And this was years ago. I don't even remember how long ago it was. The person who did this continues to harass me. And the way he does it is by going against any organization that has honored me or that hires me he will not support with his foundation. And not only does he not support it, he sends them letters and me copies of these horrible letters about what a wretched person I am and how he is not going to give money to their organization because they honored me. And to prove how wretched I am, he sends them a copy of the check that he writes to another organization in another state for the same amount that he would have given to them. And this is still going on. And uh, what can I say? I, you know, there's nothing to say. There is nothing to say. Other, and it's so embarrassing, you know, when the chairs of these organizations and whatever receive these letters and I get a copy of them so that I should know what's being said. And they are, they're unintelligible. I don't even know what is being said. Yeah, it is horrible. And when this happens, first of all, I am in touch with the, the organizations apologizing all over the place. I'm so sorry that your connection with me is causing this problem. Thankfully, the people involved are, you know, don't worry, Hashem is in charge of money. Luckily, these are all religious organizations and um, people have emuna, faith, and God is like, God is the one who provides the money. If this person and their foundation is not going to be a source, it will come from someplace else. Don't worry about it, but it's so humiliating. So they don't answer, we don't answer. Yeah, this is really crazy. So I'm just like, okay, blessing time. So I'm, I'm like, okay, who am I praying for? What situation do I need a supernatural, supernatural divine intervention? And I'm telling now I don't even remember what it was, but this, when this happened a few years ago, I'm like, okay, I'm praying for this situation within a week, the situation I was praying for had resolved. I'm like, thank you, thank you. So it's like, what do you do? It says, this is our answer to this is, okay, I'll take it. And our answer is we just continue on doing what we're doing. So at the end of the Shemona Esrei, at the end of the Amida, there's a special prayer that says, may my soul be like dust. May my soul be like dust. And so it's like, what does that mean? So what it really means is, may I not be affected by people who kick me around. It says, what happens to dust when you kick it or stomp on it? It dusts up and then it goes right back down onto your furniture. It really doesn't care. You don't say like the dust isn't crying, the dust, you cannot, you can't mess up dust. It just doesn't happen. So it says, may my soul be like dust to <laughs> these people and, and just continue on. And it says it builds strength in us. It builds spiritual strength. 
their issue with God is that's their business. It really is their business. There's nothing I can do about it. And I'm staying silent. So when this happens is we are given an incredible amount of power. It is also compared to the sun. So you may have remembered, and since it's Rosh Chodesh, it's an appropriate time to talk about this. And again, this Parsha is almost always read right around Rosh Chodesh Tammuz, if not on Rosh Chodesh Tammuz. So you might've remembered the Midrash that says that when God created the world, he created two great luminaries. He created the sun and the moon and they were of equal size. And it says that the moon went to God to complain and said, like, you can't have two kings. You can't have two bodies equally in charge. And that God said, okay, go make yourself smaller. You'll be the moon and you'll have less light. You'll reflect the sun's light. And that'll be, that'll be for you. And that's how we get the smaller moon. In the future, we say that the moon will actually be restored to the same size as the sun so that the light that we have at night will still be reflected light, but it will be as bright as the sun. Because it's only because the moon is small that we don't get so much light. If it was physically bigger, we would have more lights. Consequently, we notice a tremendous difference between how much light we have when there's a full moon versus when there's a new moon. There's a tremendous difference in how much light. If you're planning a burglary, which I don't advise you do, you wanna do it at Rosh Kodesh. Don't do it at the full moon because everyone can see you. So if the moon was bigger and every month we go outside to see if the, say maybe this will be the month when the moon is going to re return to its size. So we always focus on the moon, but nobody ever talks about how would the sun feel by having, being kind of like embarrassed and being attacked by the moon to God. Because basically what the moon was saying is, why do you have him? I should be the one in charge. I mean, God's response is actually you make yourself smaller and, uh, and don't bother me anymore about this. But the sun, how did the sun feel? Did the sun get mad at the moon? It's like, no, what does the sun do? The next day it rises and sets the way it always did. How affected is the sun by anything that happens in this world? I mean, sometimes it's crazy. I mean, we go from a very sad place during the Holocaust, you know, people wrote poems. How is it possible that the sun can continue to rise given what's going on? How is it possible that there could be a blue sky day in such a horrific circumstances? But the sun is on its course and it doesn't say like, oh, it's a bad day. I'm not really gonna come out today. I'm gonna just be, you know, it's such a bad day. I have someone salted, I'm not coming out. It's like, I'm coming out the same way I did every time. Every morning it says the sun renews its strength and it goes on its course. Being like the sun is our response. And this is Moshe's response. So he has a very unusual word. When he says there, Moshe heard and fell on his face. There was no answer. It was just total humility. It's like, there's nothing to say to what you are saying. He spoke to Korach and to his entire assembly. And he said, in the morning, now, what's interesting is the Hebrew. If you want to say in the morning in Hebrew, you say ba boker. That's a combination of ba ha boker, in the morning, ba boker. That's not what it says in Hebrew. It just says boker, morning. My answer to you, Korach, is morning. A little hint the sun. What you just said, do you think I'm going to step down and resign because you said this? Do you think I'm going to, I, there's nothing to say to you. I have no response. I'm not going to respond. What you said about these allegations don't deserve a response. And all I'm telling you is Bocare. So we can use this as a watchword. When we're in a situation, I hope it doesn't happen to people. But if it does, and somebody insults us even slightly, just say, you can say, give say, Bocare Tov. Good morning. Boker Tov, the light of day, the sun continues. I'm continuing on my way. I'm continuing on my way. I'm not affected by what you are saying. Boker Tov. So this is what Moshe's response is. And it wasn't coming from a snarky place. It was, I have no response to this. 
So there are all sorts of stories about people who have had amazing things happen to them after being blessed by someone who was publicly humiliated and who did not respond back, where they were literally chased down the street like, please, please, I heard you being embarrassed and you didn't respond, bless me. And it was for a child, a shut off or whatever, all these stories are things of like then they come true because they were all things that needed like a super extra whatever. So there's a story about Rav Kanievsky, one of the great sages, great rabbis of our time. And somebody had come to him for a blessing. A, fi- a couple had been married for 15 years. They never had any children. They really wanted a child. They wanted the Rav's blessing for a child. And he said he could tell through Ruach HaKodesh, I mean, through some sort of divine knowledge that they were not, he said, I can't, um, I, I, I can't, uh, even though he was known to be the person to go to for blessings. He said, I can't, it's not going to happen. And they were so devastated. He said, the only thing I can tell you is, if you were to find somebody who is publicly humiliated, who doesn't answer back and ask them for a blessing, the strength that they would have would like break through the natural barrier that is preventing you from having children, whatever that is. And it will, that's the only thing that could work. And so like a little while later, these people were at a wedding and a woman was publicly humiliated by kind of like a crazy person. And this woman ran over to the person being humiliated saying, don't say anything, just don't say anything. And she was like, and then after it was like, what was that? She said, she told her the story. She said, give me a bracha. The woman gave her a bracha and within the year she had a child. And it's like, you know, this is true story. This isn't like, you know, whatever kind of story, true story. So that this happens. And then so whether we're blessing someone else or we ask, have a prayer or blessing for someone else, and it doesn't have to be even a major, major thing, because the truth is, how quickly do we get insulted and answer back? We, that tends to be almost like a speed of light response. So somebody who can intercept that, that is out of this world. That is out of this world and it allows someone to enter a different dimension of reality and affect change in a different way. So not that we should be looking for trouble, but if the trouble comes our way, just say Boker Tov, morning, sun's coming out, sun's gonna do its thing, and then direct your blessing, your prayer to somebody, yourself or somebody else who really, really needs an extra measure of that. Any questions about this? Because this is kind of a different thing. Anybody? Patricia, yes. So two things. Um, when this happened to Moshe, I'm confused. Did they actually utter those that, that, that insult aloud? And that's what he heard, but they just don't, they don't put that in the Torah about the- I'm sorry, say that again, are those insults? So, so the, the insults that Korach and the group um, of having an adulterous relationship with yes, their wives. Yeah. Yes. So they said those out loud. But they, they said just those out loud. Okay. And it just wasn't recorded in Torah. Okay. Yes. And the way it's, yeah, right, it's not recorded, but it's recorded in the Talmud. So the Talmud gives the back story. Okay. And so it's there. Okay. Um, well, and it just occurs to me like, um, as painful as that is, and in, in the story that you told for yourself, it's a pretty awesome reward to have that power. It is. Yeah, it's a tremendous. It says like so that's why I say we're not looking for trouble, but <laughs> we're supposed to. I won't even say welcome it, but say it's called accepting yisurim ba'ahava of accepting challenges with love. Like okay, this is still beneficial to me. I'm benefiting from this. I am benefiting from this, and so how upset can I be about it? I am upset, but. I'm not that upset I, I, because I, I, I have something to do with it. So, um, you know, it, it even applies. It says, um, if we look at things that are said about the Jewish people that are not true, that then the Jewish people are given extra strength. And the things that we are said that are, that are told, said about us that are not true actually gives us strength to do amazing things that we might not have, that we would not naturally have been able to do. So again, we're not welcoming the the barbs um, against us, but they're not for nothing. Um, you know, and it's more like martial arts that what's the idea of, of a, if an attacker is coming toward you, from what I understand, not that I know anything about it, the goal is to take whatever energy they are taking to you and redirect it back to them. 
So it's, it's or redirect it in some other way. Uh, you don't, it's not a direct fight back against them. It is, a, it is something about the, the energy shift and what happens with this. So when this is coming at, coming at us, we can say, wow, I just got a big pile of spiritual energy. What shall I do with this? If I attack back, then it's like I'm actually throwing the gift that I've been given back to the other person. It's like, oh, and I, I want the ball in my court here because then I can do something with it. It's a fabulous way to approach life. And you'd be surprised what that can do. And it saves a lot of wear and tear on your nerves and your, uh, you know, your emotional well-being as well. So it's bizarre, but that's, that's what's out there. So that's motion's response. So that's his response to the personal attack. That's his response to the personal attack. However, he acts very strongly against Korach, very strongly against Korach for his political attack. That his, because he really sees that he's really going against God because everybody literally and their brother knows that Moshe was appointed by God and every, it was a public thing that Aaron was appointed as the high priest. So, and that B'Tzalel, who was in charge of building the Mishkan was Moshe's nephew. That was Miriam's son. Okay, so that was, so Korach was like, you know, there's a lot of nepotism going on here. Well, the irony is, and the total projection is that Korach was Moshe's cousin, his first cousin. And what he was really asking is that some of that nepotism should have been shifting over toward me. That's what he was really saying, but he just had it all disguised and got everybody all worked up over that. So that Moshe does respond to, and he responds quite harshly. So now we're going to take a look at this from a completely different perspective, from a Kabbalistic perspective, from a Gilgul HaNefesh, a reincarnation perspective. We have heard before, you might remember, that Moshe and Aaron are considered a reincarnation of Cain and Abel. What was the problem there was brothers who were jealous of each other. And the tikkun, the repair was that Aaron as the older brother was never jealous of Moshe because Moshe was concerned when God first asked him, told him he was going to be the leader. Moshe um, among the list of all the reasons why he shouldn't be in there was what about Aaron? He's my older brother. He's been the leader of the Jewish people this whole time while I've been gone. And God tells Moshe, no, Aaron, your brother will be happy in his heart for you. There will be zero jealousy. And they are considered a tikkun. Because we know what happened with Cain and Abel. Cain killed Abel out of jealousy. So they are a tikkun. We've also learned that Moshe is a tikkun for Noah. That when Noah, who did not pray for the salvation of his generation, and that the, uh, the people were wiped out at the time during the flood. And the flood is called May Noah, the waters of Noah. And that Moshe, when God says he's gonna destroy the Jewish people, Moshe says, if you destroy them, erase me from your book. And when he says erase me, the word is macheni, macheni. Menchoch means to, means to erase, macheni. The word macheni, the same letters as May Noah. He's saying, I'm not falling for that again. You can't wipe out everyone and start over with me. If you're going to wipe them out, wipe me out too. And that's what Noah should have said. So he's also considered a reincarnation of Noah. He's a tikkun on that. So you can have these multiple tikkunim. Do I understand this? Not one bit. So I'm just sharing what we know from our tradition. So there's another, another pair here. It says that Moshe and Korach our reincarnation of Cain and Abel. That Korach is Cain and Moshe is Abel. So just remember that Cain kills Abel. And what happens? So you are gonna hear something familiar. How is it that Moshe, not only does he say to God, don't accept anything that Korach does, punish him, let him die. He has a very, particular kind of punishment that he wants to have happen. What does he want to have happen? 
Anybody know? We know from the end what's going to happen. What does he say? What, what's the punishment of Korach? Is that at the beginning? You mean when he was swallowed up? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so it says, how did that happen? That the earth, how did that turn out to be the punishment? Why was that the punishment? So go to page 827. Chapter 16, verse 28 through 30. Moshe is the one who creates the punishment. Moshe said, through this shall you know that Hashem sent me to perform all these acts, that it was not from my heart, because Korach was saying, Moshe is making up the mitzvahs. He made up Techelet, he made up the mezuzah, he's making up all this stuff. This had to be stopped in its tracks. It says, if these die, these Korach and his men, die like the death of all men and the destiny of all men is visited upon them, then it is not Hashem who has sent me. So he's saying, if these people just die a regular way, then you'll know that Hashem was not the one who sent me. But if Hashem will create a phenomena and the earth opens its mouth and swallows them and all that is theirs and they will descend alive to the pit, then you shall know that these men have provoked Hashem. When he finished speaking all these words, the ground that was under them split open. The earth opened its mouth and swallowed them and their households and all the people who were with Korach and the entire wealth. This is, who created the punishment? Moshe. I have to say, I always kind of overlooked that. I always thought that Moshe was like, punish them. And it was God's decision. Like, I'm going to open up the earth and it's a swallow. It's like, no, Moshe called it. But why was it that? Why was it about the earth opening up? Why wasn't it more like, maybe like Nadav and Avihu, you know, let them, you know, like a fire come from God and just take their souls right out of them. That was pretty unnatural. That was pretty godlike. Why did it have to be open up the ground? Anybody have any idea, Patricia? So I'm thinking if it was reincarnation of Cain and Abel, and then there was something about Abel's blood that soaked into the earth or something like that. He do. Exactly. So if you go back to Genesis, to when that all happened, and you go to chapter four, and this is after Cain has killed Abel, and he, the God asks Cain, where's your brother? And he responds, his most, one of the most famous verses that everyone knows, am I my brother's keeper? Then God said to him, verse 10, then he said, what have you done? The blood of your brother cries out to me from the ground. Therefore, you are cursed more than the ground, which opened wide its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Okay. This is that. It says, you've got the earth opening up. And before the earth opened up, and it was Abel's blood that went in. If Abel is Moshe, it's like we have a, we have a midah, connected midah scenario here, a measure for measure scenario. Cain caused the earth to open up and accept the, and to, to have to take in the blood of his brother, Hevel, Abel. Moshe sees what's going on here. He sees that this is coming from that. This is that. It's like, here we go. Not just like this is some adversary who I need to get rid of. There are other ways to get rid of adversaries. There's a lot of ways to get rid of adversaries. Why this way? is he saw it for what it was. This was an attempt to undo and to have a redoing of Cain and Abel. And it's not, this was going to undo creation. This was, this, this was not a personal attack against Moshe. This was a cosmic primordial scenario that is happening again. And so Moshe's like, there's no, there's no fix for this. And this was, and this was, this was after Moshe tried. He tried. He went and he, he tried to get them to back down. And when he tried to get them to back down, this is actually sorry. Is he tries to get them to back down. Um, so if you go to uh, page 823, which is chapter 16 of Bamidbar, of Numbers, verse 8, Moshe says to Korah, Hear now, O offspring of Levi. Is it not enough for you that the God of Israel has segregated you from the assembly of Israel to draw you near to himself, to perform the service of the tabernacle of Hashem, 
and to stand before the assembly to minister to them. And he drew you near and all your brethren, the offspring of Levi with you. Yet you, and Sir, this is where Moshe calls it, even though this isn't what Korach said, yet you seek priesthood also as well. Korach had never said that, but Moshe saw exactly what was going on. Korach wanted to be the Kohen Gadol. He wanted to get rid of Aaron. It's not happening. It's not happening. So there's no conversation there. And it's really that you are protesting against Hashem. And then Moshe makes an effort. He summons, in verse 12, he sent forth to summon Datan and Aviram, the sons of Eliav. But they said, well, not going, we're not coming up to him. We're not coming up to you, Moshe. And then they start distorting everything. You brought us up from a land flowing with milk and honey to cause us to die in the wilderness. Yet you seek to dominate us, even to dominate further. And you did not bring us to a land flowing with milk and honey. Moshe's like, this is not getting fixed. This is not getting fixed. So he takes a very, very strong measure. And the thing that's so sad, like all great people who make fatal errors, is Korah was an amazing person. He was. Not only did he have the power and the wealth and the regard and the knowledge, his descendant is the prophet Samuel, who was considered on equal level with Moshe and Aaron. He's just in a different silo. And every Friday night, one of the Tehillim, one of the Psalms is Moshe and Aaron and Samuel. It's like, where'd he come from? Pulled out of thin air out of all the prophets. Why does it say Moses, Aaron, and Isaiah? Moses, Aaron, and Jeremiah. Moses, Aaron, and Samuel. We're all considered people who reach their full potential in their roles. Moshe as leader, Aaron as Kohen Gadol, and Samuel as judge and prophet. So if Korah would have only seen how great he was and what he had to contribute, but it wasn't to be Moshe and it wasn't to be Aaron. It was such a fatal flaw. So it wasn't some like, you know, little nobody person who decides they want to be in charge. In fact, that's usually not who it is. It's somebody who's so close, but they think that their job is to eclipse the other person. But that's their job, is to eclipse, or to take over, or to take away. Moshe's like, no, it can't happen. It can't happen. The earth needs to swallow this up. And then we'll have a tikkun. That will be the repair. That will be the, the consequence for Korach's actions. Because the same thing happened with Cain and Hevel. Why did Cain kill Hevel. Does anybody know why did Cain kill Hevel? Anybody know? Patricia, want to unmute and say? Um, well, he was humiliated because of his sacrifice was, was inferior to his brothers. Right, his sacrifice was inferior and he was, he was upset because God accepted Hevel's sacrifice and not his own. And God addresses Cain directly and says, all you need to do is improve yourself. You know, what you don't, it, this has nothing to do with Hevel. You are in two separate categories. You're making a mistake thinking that the answer is to be upset with Hevel. The answer is to be upset with yourself and improve yourself, to keep your eyes on your paper and to do your tough key, your purpose in this world. It's not to undermine Hevel, but he didn't hear it. He couldn't hear it and he kills him. So the same thing is happening here. This is the same conversation, only magnified. And now we have a people and Moshe is Hevel and Korach is Kayan. And he's saying, Ravachem Le Levi, you have so much. You do your Levi thing. You're amazing. No, I want to be the Kohen Gadol. It's like, there's no answer. There is no solution to that existential challenge. There is no solution. That needs to be buried. That has to go away. And that's what happens. And so that's why Moshe has such a harsh response to Korach. Because Moshe is all about for being the um, being the whatever, the the advocate for the Jewish people. The advocate for the Jewish people. 
And when you advocate for the Jewish people, the sin of the spies, the sin of the golden calf, he's like, God, forgive them. What will the Egyptians say? It's not going to look good for you. How could you do this? They're going to say, you couldn't even bring them in. You weren't strong enough. Forgive them, forgive them, forgive them. Moshe does not say that to God. He's saying to God, you take care of this right now. <laughs> you take care of this right now. And he does. So it's really crazy. So Lois sent a message to me about coveting. This is such a huge thing of what coveting really means. And we talked about this. Rabbi David Foreman had a, just a beautiful thing about um, all of the Ten Commandments. And the Ten Commandments, uh, let's see, all the others were in agreement with anyone but Moshe. We are now seeing antagonists. Yes, I don't see the rest of your chat, but yes, uh, Rachel, I didn't see the rest of it. Let me see, hold on one second. Um, Okay. We're not going to talk about that kind of politics. We're going to talk about when we have these things, these challenges that, that come to us. So I'm sorry, I just wanted to say, I forgot, I'm sorry, I forgot my chain of thought. Um, does anybody remember what I was getting ready to say? Coveting. Talking about David Thank Foreman. You. Thank you, David Foreman of the coveting. So he lines up each of the uh, 10 commandments, one with six, two with seven, three with eight, etc., And the one the last one of thou shalt not covet goes with honoring parents. It's, it's the same thing. And I just think this is so brilliant the way he points this out. That the, the, sin, the, the commandment that says that thou shalt not covet specifically says thou shalt not covet. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, your maidservant, the, basically the horse, the house, the car, the, you know, the membership, the job. It goes into a whole list. What does this mean? It says when you covet somebody else's everything, you're not really coveting the things. It's that you want to be them. If I said to Helene, you know, I want, you know, I really, I want your couch, your art, your clothes, your husband, your car. What am I really saying? I'm not really saying I want those things. What I'm really saying is if I had all the things that belong to you, I would be you. I would get to be you. I want to be you and not me. It is, an, it is my identity that I am rejecting. And that is considered to the, the pair of that is not honoring your parents. Because when you say you don't want to be you, in the end, you're saying, and you know what? For good measure, I wish my parents, your parents were also my parents. I wish I wasn't me. Well, how did you get to be you by your parents? So when we honor our parents, what we're really saying is, I honor who I am, which is how we can honor parents who were not the best parents. This is not my mom and dad deserve mom and dad of the year award. They may not. They may be far from that. It's really a statement of, I value my life. I value who I am. And since you created me, I cannot deny and I cannot not respect you because you created me. In a way, it's very self-serving. You're saying, I respect me. I love me. And if I love me, then I'm not trying to be somebody else. This doesn't mean I'd like a painting like yours. I'd like a couch like yours. That's just jealousy. That's not coveting. Covening is where Korach says, I want to be the Kohen Gadol, not I want to be as close to God as the Kohen Gadol, because he was, and he couldn't see it. Couldn't see it. Such a huge message for us. So from both sides, from both sides of how we looked at Korach and about Moshe, that the allegations that were completely fabricated on Moshe's character, Moshe says nothing. He falls on his face in total humility. Nothing to say. There's nothing to say. And all I can tell you, Korach, is Boker. Boker Tov. I'm the leader of the Jewish people. There's nothing you can do to change that. I can't. I can't resign. First of all, I can't resign. God won't let me resign. I can't resign. I tried that already. You know, take this away from me. Kill me now. I'm not going to be in charge of these people. It's like, no, yes, you are. I'll give you some help, but you are in charge. And you can't be the Kohen Gadol. So, Boker Tov. But when it comes to the actual threat of what you're trying to do to the Jewish people and to God, 
and I see what you're doing, if this coveting thing of our positions, that's a whole other thing. And that has to be dealt with harshly. And I see what this is. This is the same conversation as Cain and Abel. And we're going to fix this this time. And you're going to be swallowed up because that's the tikkun. That's the tikkun. A very powerful, we don't even get past the very opening of the Parsha. And it's like, whoa. So this is our message as we go into Tammuz, because we think, <coughs> excuse me, on Rosh Chodesh, where we're referencing the moon and the moon. And we usually focus on that story. But what about the sun? What was the sun's response? The sun's response is, I'm the sun. I'm the sun. And that's our response too, is I'm me. As they say, you do you. I do me. You do you. And I do me. And that's the way that we really will have shalom in this world. That's our answer. God willing, this month of Tammuz, we will pull it up from its depths. That's our, that is our answer. We must employ our eye in tov, our good eye, and to see ourselves and other people from a place, and it doesn't mean just positive. It means from the place of good. An eye in tov means a good eye, not a nice eye, a good eye. I see that what is happening in my life is good for me. Even the challenges and the insulters, it's good for me. I see that what's happening for other people is good for them. And I see the situations, regardless of what they look like, are good for God's ultimate plan. And I can enjoy it now. I can create the space. I cannot say tachanun. I'm creating the space. It's going to be a moed tov. It's going to be a holiday. And I can start kind of observing it now. And that's our goal. That willing, the 17th of Tammuz comes and it actually is a holiday. We don't ever really get totally prepared for, in fact, it used to be a tradition that people did not print up in a hardback book, um, lamentations for Tisha B'Av or all the, the keynote, all of the dirges and everything else. It's like, why would you make it in a hardback? That's saying that you want it to last to next year. I, this, I, this could really be made out of something that decomposes like right after use. I'm hoping to not have to ever use this again. And it will all be basimcha. It'll all be a time of joy. So God willing, we're going to work on that and we're going to make it happen. And it's our effort, our joy, our ayin tov that is going to help it materialize in a very real way for everybody. I will miss you all next week. And then we will resume on the at the end of the end of uh, june and then i will be off for the month of july so thank you very much and um anybody who missed or whatever i'm going to upload the class now to the website and you'll feel free to send it on to anybody else have a wonderful shabbos and chodesh tov it should be filled with only good things and much blessing success happiness prosperity everything amazing for you and your families amen Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Chodesh Tov. Chodesh Tov. Thank you. Ellen? Yes. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, you said Rabbi David Foreman. Yes. Um, there was a, there, Rabbi David Foreman is the same one when I was in Baltimore was one of my teachers. And I don't know if you're, if that's the same person, you know. Probably, because I think he's from Baltimore. Yeah. And is he in Israel now? I don't know where he is. No, he isn't. He's, um, I think he lives in, in Woodmere. New York. Where? Woodmere. Oh, New in New York. York. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Because we, we had a Torah group, a women's Torah group for about three years and, and it, it, it was fabulous. He, he's just an incredible human, human being and teacher. He Love is him. so amazing. And yeah. so you would have really appreciate some of the different books he's written. Um, one is the Esther, the the queen you thought you knew. The queen you oh. thought you knew. Amazing book. I reread it every Purim. Mm. I don't know that he even wrote any books. It's been a while. Yeah. Yeah. He, this is, um, he wrote this one maybe about 10 years ago. Oh, okay. And then he's written a new one. Um, let's see. He's written one. I think I'm very I I don't have it. I'd love to have it. Um, but I think he wrote one on Genesis also. Mm. But if you, if you Google him, you'll be able to see the things that he's okay. written. Yeah. He, and he has a site now. It's called Aleph Beta. And oh. it's 
and you should check that out too, Olive Beta, and he does these really great animated videos about the Parsha, about the holidays, and they're all just David Foreman Torah. It's just yeah. so he, he did he did Job with us for about a year and a half, and it was incredible. He also did Talmud with with a group of women. Oh, you really know, nice. Okay. And brought up the string theories and quantum, you know, this and that, and and he's just he he's amazing he's <laughs> the, amazing and the way the the interesting way that, that he teaches which has been different than that some of my other teachers and other people is that he would start out there and then by the hour hour and a half two hours he would bring it in so you then because you couldn't understand what the heck he was doing but then he would bring it in and go ah now i understand it's so great so i'm assuming this is the same david foreman and one of the yes, questions he loves say- one of the questions he loves to ask is where have we seen this before and so yes. like you, so that even that question which yeah. this wasn't from David Foreman but even that question about yeah. earth opening up where have we seen that before yeah. well there's only one other yes. reference which is and then and then the, and then as soon as you hear it you're like of course of course i already knew that but and yeah. he talks about kind of um i forget what he's called like the lullaby effect or something when you're so familiar <clears throat> with a story you stop seeing the story. And he has a way mm. to be able with fresh eyes yeah. to unpack yeah. the text. Amazing. Yeah. The, the one word in Job, what, at, to explain Job, and I have to go in and see what that word is, but it was, it was like, he spent hours and hours on one word. And he would, what is that book called where you find all those things? The contrib- okay. con- Concordan- what? Concordancia. Concordancia. Okay. Concordance. Yeah, concord. yeah. Yeah. And then you can find, and we did. That's, that is very much what he did. Yeah. I had it in the same one. He's a young man. He's probably in his 50s, 60s by now. Yes. Yeah. 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 Fabulous. Yeah. What, yeah. Remind yeah, me. Yeah. Enjoy. Enjoy. Yeah. You'll really, really like the queen you thought you knew. And any yeah. of the things he does are amazing. Yeah. Okay. Cool. All Thank right. you. My Listen. pleasure. Enjoy your grandchildren. <laughs> Thank you so much. I plan to, God willing. All right. So I have you real quick. Anything going on as far as the Israeli trip? Um, so we are in the process of finalizing our itinerary okay. and okay. we'll wait to see what happens. Um, we're guessing that by that time, they're trying to open up by Sukkot, um, that people will have a, 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 a test at the airport and they'll have to wait for results. So hopefully it'll be a quick one, maybe just like a few hours. We'll have to see what happens. So we're going to make it work um, unless God willing, there's calm and God willing, there's, we can go and God willing, there's yeah. not a, anything else or anything that we haven't even thought of that could happen that yeah. hopefully it's all good, but we are moving forward and feeling the most optimistic that we have felt in a oh, year good. and a half. So great. Good. We're on it. All right. Thank you. All right. Take good care. Have a wonderful Shabbos. Chodesh Tov, and I will see you in a couple weeks. All right. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye.